welcome back to my channel for my top 10 favourite thriller novels of all time. Yes, I've said it. This is an ever-changing list, to be honest. I feel like thrillers are something um, that I am constantly discovering new favourites in. I think it's just because every time you read a really compelling thriller and get to the end and those twists and the turns have kept you on hook and then you're so shocked by the ending, it's hard not to let it, you know, overtake some of your previous favourites. However, these are 10 books uh, within the thriller genre that I've read over the past few years, some were recently but some a few years ago now that have stuck with me and I really feel like deserve um, even more readers. I mean some of them are already quite popular and you've probably heard of them but if you haven't then please give them a shot because they are fantastic and I thought it would be good to get this video up this month since I know um, a bunch of you are like me in the mood for something a little bit more eerie, a little bit more creepy, a little bit more thrilling. These are aren't horror novels, there's no paranormal elements to them, there's no fantastical elements to them, although some of them definitely go down the darker side of thrillers, so I guess are kind of tangential to horror in a way, but the premise is very much rooted in that kind of mystery thriller element and without further ado therefore let's just jump straight into the books. I'm going to start with the books I have physical copies of since they're here in my lap and then I'll move on to the four which I don't and the first one is The Family Upstairs by Lisa Jewell. This is one of the most recent books to make it on this list, not the most recent because I read two thrillers in a row in the past few months which I just could not stop thinking about, <laughs> this being one of them. This was one that my friend Leanne had been telling me to read for the longest time she said it was a complete and utter page turner that you could sit and read it in one day despite the fact that it's over 400 pages and she was not lying. I didn't read it in a day but I certainly could have if I'd had the free time and I very much felt as though I needed to return to it every time I put it down because I wanted to know what was going on. And it's a multiple perspective thriller. We have three perspectives in this novel. We have I guess you could say the central character who is a young woman in her 20s that has just inherited a million pound townhouse in Chelsea of London. If you're familiar with Chelsea you'll know how expensive, I mean one million really doesn't cover it. <laughs> Multi-million pound house which belonged to her parents, her biological parents who she has never known because they died when she was only one years old in what was assumed to be a suicide pact and there is so much mystery surrounding her backstory and where she came from, especially the fact that both of her siblings were never found, they disappeared after her parents death and she wasn't actually discovered as a baby until a week after her parents passing so who had been caring for her a baby doesn't just survive by itself for an entire week alone someone had been there with her in the house and it is about that family the mystery surrounding her birth story and who her parents and siblings were and possibly are. We then follow another woman who we don't entirely know the origins of at the beginning of the story, so I won't give it away, who's living in France but is desperate to get back to London because she knows that the time has come for this other young woman to inherit the house and she clearly has some attachment to that um, and investment in that so she's decided to travel back to London and then we also follow the older brother of the baby who is a child in his part of the narrative it's the 1980s and he is in this house growing up and um, telling us effectively what happened, how this family spiralled out of control in the past and it is so compelling. I do think there's something to be said for a well done multiple perspective narrative in really maintaining and creating mystery especially when it um, has multiple timelines. I love multiple timelines in my thrillers. I think it really adds to the compelling nature of the read and helps hook you in because every time you finish one chapter you move on to the next perspective and you're both invested in that perspective but want to return to the other one so you, you turn the page um, and I think that's something that's a part of a few of these books. So yeah, I love this. I am so excited to read more by Lisa Jill, so excited that I'm actually currently listening to another one of her books right now on audio and really, really enjoying it. So yes, this was a great discovery for me and probably a new favourite thriller author. 
The next one on my pile, I would maybe categorise as literary thriller, although in saying that, I think anyone who is a big fan of literary fiction and maybe wants to get more into thriller mysteries should definitely check out The Family Upstairs because it's very, very well written and quite beautiful in moments. So this is The Majesties by Tiffany Sow. Uh, the subtitle of this one is She Would Kill For Her Family, but the for is crossed out. It's told from the perspective of Gwendolyn, who is one of two sisters who've grown up as members of this wealthy Chinese-Indonesian family. They are um, of Chinese descent but they live in Indonesia and she finds herself in a coma and she is aware of her surroundings but she cannot speak or communicate and she overhears the nurses in her hospital ward talking about the fact that her sister Estella poisoned their entire family at a family gathering. So Gwendolyn is the only person to have survived this mass murder including her sister. Her sister has died and she is in this coma. So she obviously can't communicate or do anything from this position and ends up reflecting back on her history and the story of her and her sister's upbringing and childhood and early adult years, trying to place what happened and figure out what happened and what led her sister to this point of no return and put her in this hospital bed. And it is such an interesting novel because it largely takes part in the past. We're largely following um, these two sisters in the past from Gwendolyn's perspective and for large chunks of the novel I kind of forgot about the setup not in a bad way but I would forget that I was actually learning about this from the perspective of someone who was in a coma because I was so compelled by their past and the story of their past that I kind of forgot why I was learning it because it was so intriguing in itself and there's a ton of family secrets and interesting family dynamics throughout this that every time I was reminded that I was actually learning this from a comatose patient I was like oh my god yes of course why did that happen and I would be returned to that moment of intrigue and it was such a fun and intriguing way to structure a novel but it was also beautifully written and full of so many surprises. I do actually have two YA thriller mysteries on this list, the first of which is A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. This for me is like the epitome of the YA thriller genre. It does exactly what I want in a YA thriller. It is just a really great example of that subgenre of both YA, which is obviously an age range but often deals with similar themes as well as thrillers. So I love the way that the parts come together here and it's actually the first in a trilogy. So I've read books one and two and I've just picked up book three because it only came out recently and cannot wait for the conclusion of this story. But each book is its own mystery and we follow Pip, a teenage girl living in a small town in England, although what's interesting is that in the American edition of this book, they have it set in America, they change the town names and a few of the words um, so that it can be believably set in America and um, I know I have confused a few people in the past when I've talked about this book being set in England but the original is set in England and it is by an English author. So the premise of this novel is that Pip has undertaken a school project, an independently chosen school project where she can do anything she wants in order to get like extra credit and she has decided to investigate the disappearance of a girl of around her age that went missing about five years back now. So no one was ever convicted of this girl's disappearance but there was a ton of suspicion surrounding her boyfriend and everyone's basically like convicted him by public opinion and he ended up leaving the town and his family became pariahs. But Pip just doesn't believe that narrative. She remembers Sal, this boyfriend, and she knows Sal's younger brother, and this just never quite fit for her. And she's a little bit obsessed with true crime, so she ends up, like I said, investigating um, this past mystery for a school project and ends up uncovering some new and interesting pieces to the mystery. Holly Jackson is an absolute expert when it comes to the red herring. She is so great at placing clues throughout her novels, some of which are relevant, some of which are not, and some of which will lead you down paths that are just completely disparate from what you thought you were getting yourself into and it's so compelling and keeps you guessing and I absolutely loved it. The second book was just as excellent, was just as fascinating a mystery and I'm sure the third one will be too. Okay but when I was talking about The Family Upstairs I mentioned that I'd recently read two thrillers back to back which I fell in love with and this one is definitely on the darker side of thrillers which is Blood Orange by Harriet Tice. I had no idea that this book was going to be as thought provoking as it was but it has really stayed with me. And I actually really struggled to sleep the night I finished it because I had so many thoughts whirring around in my head, both about the book and the mystery, but also larger themes that it touched on. 
So this is about a solicitor who lives in uh, London and she has been handed her first ever murder case to defend. So she is defending this woman who has murdered her husband. There's no question that she murdered her husband but perhaps the circumstances surrounding this murder are a little bit more complicated than it may at first appear. And I thought that was going to be the focus of this novel, and it certainly is, it's an important part of her career, it's an interesting sort of side mystery, and there's a lot of parallels between the different um, sort of strands in this book, but it's actually far more about her life. She's involved in an affair, you learn this very, very, very early on. She is married and has um, a small child, but like I said, is involved in this affair. And it's a book that very much looks at gaslighting, it looks at sexual harassment, um, consent, kind of workplace toxicity, toxic relationships, and it is so compulsive and you're just never quite sure who to trust, who to believe, who's in the wrong. And yes, our protagonist is by, is by no means perfect, I mean, she's literally committing adultery, um, but it is such an interesting novel and you still feel so invested in her life and how everything's going to work out, even if you don't agree with the way she's approaching it. And I ended up, like I said, so invested in her story and so much of it is focused on her story and I don't want to spoil it because there's lots of interesting twists and turns, but it's also, like I said, quite a dark novel, it very much goes there, there is um, sexual assault and rape featuring in this narrative and everything else I already mentioned to be honest but really well written, really well constructed and a really compelling read. We then have the only book on this list to have any hints at the paranormal but it's not really a paranormal book and that is You Let Me In by Camilla Bruce. So this is about a woman, it's about her as a girl, about her as a young woman and about her as an older woman. She is a best-selling novelist whose husband died under mysterious circumstances, whose father died under mysterious circumstances and there's always been those that have suspected that maybe she was involved in these crimes but it could never be proven and it's about her life like I said from those very early years from her perspective and her perspective includes the fact that she sees fairies so she has grown up surrounded by these fairy creatures who she has both a negative and positive relationship with particularly one fae named Pepperman and these are not <laughs> cutesy Tinkerbell fairies these are dark creatures that feed on the essence of humans to stay alive and are actually the result of uh, lost souls and the dead who have remained on this earth and they're made of sticks and leaves and pose a threat and pose a threat to those around them but also keep our protagonist safe and keep her company when she is potentially going something through when she is potentially going through something quite traumatic because what this book constantly hints at and the question that is constantly um, at the forefront of this novel is whether these fairy type creatures are real or whether they are a hallucination or coping mechanism that Cassandra the protagonist has created for herself to deal with trauma that she is experiencing and you gradually learn throughout the story both her sort of narrative of events and her side of the story as well as the thoughts of her therapist and what they thought was actually going on and it's so compelling again very dark but really really beautifully written like the prose in this are stunning and I need to read something else by this author because I was so impressed uh, by their ability to just weave together the English language in such a beautiful yet horrific way and it's a book of conflicting imagery and contrast and it's incredible. Lastly for the physical editions I have here When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. This has been compared to Rear Window meets Get Out I have to say I think the rear window element of this book is very minor. I can see why those comparisons are made but I wouldn't go into expecting too much of a rear window narrative. It is however a book that very much deals with themes of racism and gentrification particularly in the US but these are not issues that um, are only 
apparent in the US so there's a lot of parallels there to um, many different countries and what I feel is because it's such an excellent balance of different things it's such a layered novel. So Alyssa Cole has published tons of romance novels in the past she is very much known as a romance novelist and this was her first foray into the thriller genre and she brings a hint of that romance to this story because we have two characters, two protagonists. One is a young black woman who has always lived in this part of the US, who's always grown up in this neighbourhood and she is now taking care of her mother's home while her mother is ill and greedy real estate agents are trying to force her out because of the gentrification that's happening in this area. Lots and lots of particularly white families, wealthy families are moving in um, to what are quite cheap houses given the size and uh, the age of them and doing them up and hoping to you know skyrocket property prices and just change the area entirely and one of those new families is actually a young couple who are not really a couple anymore. Um, so we have a young man who's actually from a more working class background and his very wealthy girlfriend who bought this place together but then ended up falling out and are no longer a couple. So they're sleeping in separate rooms but obviously own this house together so it's an interesting dynamic. And this young man is our secondary perspective and they are both experiencing different facets of the gentrification of this area, one who has sort of inadvertently participated in that, even if they didn't intend to, another whose entire history is being disturbed because of that, and the potentially far more insidious and purposeful forces at play in this whole project. So what I mean by that is perhaps there are people and organisations that are implementing a much heavier hand in the purposeful gentrification and eradication of this black neighbourhood. It has characters you care about and you root for but also are never quite sure whether to trust or not. Moving on to the books I do not have physical copies of. Two of these I actually did have physical copies of and you know sometimes you read a book and you think oh I enjoyed that but I'm not going to read it again. I'll just pass it on to a friend, give it up, give it to charity and then a little while later you're like I wish I kind of kept that because that is a book actually I maybe would have revisited and two of these are definitely <laughs> those. <laughs> the other two I read on Kindle so <laughs> that was never an issue but the first one is The House of Correction by Nikki French. So this is my first and only Nikki French novel I've read. Nikki French are a duo, a man and a woman who write together under the name of Nikki French and it's a thriller author that my friend Jen has been telling me to read for the longest time and I finally got around to reading one. They have an entire series about one character in particular but this is one of their standalone novels and it is about a woman in England who has been imprisoned on the accusation that she murdered her neighbour. Her neighbour's body, an older man, was found in her garage or shed, I forget, I think it was a shed, and she has no idea how he got there. She has struggled with depression in the past and experiences blackouts and sort of dissociative uh, moments, so she can't be entirely sure what she was doing or what was going on when this man's body was placed in her shed, but she's convinced that she did not kill him. And she decides that she is going to represent herself. Whether this is a very good decision or not is uh, yet to be seen um, but she ends up having to try and investigate this mystery herself from within prison. And not only is this a really compelling mystery with a really interesting multifaceted layered character who you very much sympathise for, sometimes you feel infuriated by because you wonder why they're doing that but can also understand how it's so difficult for them to make decisions in the situation they're in. It's also a book that very much I think looks at the sort of injustices of prisons, um, the justice system and women's prisons and women's experience in prisons in the UK and I really appreciate that because I really really like a book that looks more sort of critically at the justice system so quite often you'll get a mystery or a thriller where the police officer or the lawyer is the hero and they're out for justice and to save the world but 
it doesn't always work like that. Sometimes the person that is put in prison that's been accused of the crime is not the person that deserves to be there. And this book looks at the difficulties and the intricacies of a system which in lots of ways is rigged against people, is very difficult to understand and this woman must fight against to simply just find the truth. And it's so well done and I thought the fact that it was set in a prison and the entire events of the novel were occurring whilst this character was in the prison were really really fascinating I think it created, it created a really interesting environment for a mystery thriller and I never quite knew what to expect it is one of those stories that like I said because um, our character has experienced blackouts you can't quite rely on her narrative entirely but you're still so invested in her life and you very much root for her. The next book which I wish I kept my physical copy for is actually one of the books that very much cemented my love of the thriller genre in general. This was one of the first thrillers I feel like was a five star read for me and I went on to read many more books by this author which is Black Eyed Susans by Julia Heberlin. So this is one that does what I mentioned before is one of my favourite things in thrillers and that is a multiple timeline narrative. So we don't have a multiple perspectives here, we only have have um, the one narrator but she is narrating the book from two different periods in time. So when she was a teenager she was the only survivor of a serial killer. She was abducted by this serial killer but ended up surviving. She managed to escape, return to her life and was rescued. And we follow both the timeline in which she is visiting her therapist after this has taken place, so she's obviously going to therapy because she was abducted and almost murdered by a serial killer and she is talking about her childhood and her relationships and her friendships and how she feels about what happened to her and what she can remember because it's all a little bit blurry. And then we are following this same character in the present who is now a middle-aged woman with her own daughter and it has come to light that the man that was incarcerated for her abduction may not be the man after all. This man's death row sentence is coming up, he's about to be executed and a young lawyer is trying to have his sentence overturned and ends up asking for our protagonist's help because this man was convicted on the back of obviously abducting her but she wasn't necessarily ever fully invested in him as being her abductor, she didn't quite see his face, she never testified to that extent, uh, it was other evidence that put him away and they decide to start investigating whether it was this man or it was somebody else that abducted her when she was a teenager. So like I said we've got those multiple timelines and for me that created an incredible page turner of a novel because I would read the chapters set in her therapist's office and be so hooked and so enthralled by what was going on and then I would reach the end of it and think but I want to stay in this timeline. Then I would start on the present day timeline and fall into that and become entirely hooked up it, and become entirely caught up in that part of the story only for that to end again, wish it was continuing on but also want to know what was happening in the past. So I just could not stop turning the pages, I loved every single second of it, every single chapter of it and the pacing was so deftly done I feel. I loved this book. I did mention however that there were two YA thrillers in this <laughs> video so the second of those is Truly Devious by Maureen Johnson. So this one's a little bit different because it's actually the first in a series where the mystery carries on throughout the series. So although there are definite revelations within each book, the overarching mystery takes place over the course of the entire series. And it is all wrapped up by book three, but a fourth book has just come out. And I haven't read book four yet, and I don't know how it's connected to the previous three books, because like I said, it does wrap up in the first three books. If it's a new mystery, if it's connected to the original mystery, I don't know, and I'm looking forward to finding out. However, what we have in this book is another multiple timeline story, but a very, very separate timeline. Because the main events of this book are following a teenage girl called Stevie who has gotten into this prestigious boarding school for like gifted and talented kids that have a passion in order to, you know, nurture and encourage this passion. And she wants to be a FBI agent or a private investigator. She's obsessed with true crime and solving mysteries. And there's actually a mystery surrounding this boarding school, something that happened way back in the early 1900s 
1900s in the 1920s I think it was when this school was in its early years. The founder of this school, the man who set it up, his daughter was abducted and went missing and no one ever found her and no one knows what happened to her or whether she survived or not. And Stevie's convinced if she gets a place at this boarding school then she can actually solve that mystery as well and that will be her sort of school project. It's an odd school but it, it's a fun concept. So we have some of those elements of YA teen drama in that she's making new friends and meeting new people and there's a potential young romance with a boy who has his own stuff going on. But we also have the mystery element and it's not just the mystery of the past, it's also the mystery of the present because things start to happen in Stevie's timeline which may or may not be connected with the past but certainly present danger in the present and I really enjoyed the way that the mystery sort of overarched as I mentioned and carried on throughout all three books. I found it very compelling and there was always enough answers in one book but also new questions introduced that kept me reading. And last but certainly not least for this video is A Madness of Sunshine by Nalini Singh. So this is a mystery thriller novel set in New Zealand, in rural New Zealand, in a community predominantly inhabited by native New Zealanders and we follow a woman who left this small town many many years ago, moved away to London, was a classical musician, got married but now her husband has died and upon his death she discovered he was also having an affair. So her whole life has sort of fallen apart and she decides to return to the town that she said she would never return to because of the things that happened there of which you don't quite know at the beginning. We then also follow the new police officer who has been recently positioned in this small town, the only police officer, the sort of man in charge of the area that is an outsider, who becomes responsible for leading the search for a missing girl when a teenager goes missing and no one can understand what happened to her. Her disappearance becomes his responsibility but obviously he's going to need the help of the local community, those that understand the land and the terrain and the backstory and relationships between everyone living there, including this newcomer who's actually an oldcomer but to him is a newcomer because they've never met before and Eleni Singh's another author who writes romance and those themes filter into this novel. There's a romance between the police officer and this woman who's moved back to her hometown which I really really enjoyed. I really liked their dynamic. It doesn't take away from the mystery of the novel, it doesn't feel like it's predominantly a romance but it feels like a really nice addition to the overall narrative and something you can root for and become invested in throughout the story. It's also stunningly written. The writing in this is gorgeous, it creates such a rich atmosphere and the depiction of the landscape in rural New Zealand in particular is so rich, is so tangible. It desperately made me want to visit rural New Zealand. I felt like I was there, it was so evocative and it just added to the whole atmosphere and general joy of the reading experience both in the mysterious sense and the romantic sense. I loved it. But those are my top 10 favourite thriller novels in no particular order. These are fantastic books I would highly recommend that you pick up. If you have, let me know if you read them and whether you enjoyed them or not. I'd also love to hear what your favourite thrillers are and what you would recommend to me because right now I'm actually in a massive thriller reading mood and I cannot get enough. So if you could add some more to my TBR, it would be appreciated. But until next time, happy reading and I'll see you all again soon. Bye everyone.